You know, today I will be completing the, uh, the third of a series of sermons. A few weeks ago, we talked about the presence of God. Um, we learned that God is omnipresent. But at the same time, believers get to experience the manifest presence of God. And in the Old Testament, God manifested His presence with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Remember that sermon, right? And then we talked about the persons of God. We had an interesting discussion about the divine persons of God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So today we are going to talk and study the power of God. So if the presence of God talks about His omnipresence, the power of God talks about His omnipotence. So it's an attribute of the Lord. So we are going to read later on from the book of Daniel. And we know that the main character, aside from God, in the book of Daniel, is obviously Daniel. Right? But there is a second character in the book who is very popular both in biblical and extra biblical sources. And I'm referring to King Nebuchadnezzar. So if the book of Daniel is a movie and there is an Academy Awards, you know, Daniel could easily win the best actor uh, trophy. But King Nebuchadnezzar will definitely get the best supporting actor category because he had a very important role in Daniel's book. So we are going to talk about the power of God in an unlikely context from the point of view of somebody who is very popular and very powerful. You know, sometimes when somebody says that someone is powerful, you look at the person speaking. If the person is a weak person and the other one he is talking about, he is saying he's powerful, maybe he's not really powerful. It's just from the perspective of somebody who is weak, right? But when somebody who is very powerful talks about the power of someone else, then people listen because it has more impact, right? So King Nebuchadnezzar is a very powerful king. He's very popular even during our time today. Kanye West made an opera in 2019 entitled Nebuchadnezzar. Some people called it Gopera, Gospel and Opera. And it's a mix of gospel and opera songs. He did have a play, an opera uh, concert entitled Nebuchadnezzar. So please stand, church, and we shall read from the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verses 34 to 37. So we are reading from the ESV. Remember that the Bible is God's word. This is our ultimate source of truth for righteous living. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So let us read from the book of Daniel. Just give me a second. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Praise the Lord for his words. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your everlasting power in our lives, and may we understand you today, Lord. You are great, and you are mighty, and your wisdom cannot be measured. May we live in humility knowing that the God we worship is omnipotent. And may the Holy Spirit give us the peace and the comfort each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Wonderful passage. One of my favorite Bible characters is King Nebuchadnezzar. 
So Nebuchadnezzar is actually historically his Nebuchadnezzar II. He is also called Nebuchadnezzar. And he was considered the greatest king of the Babylonian Empire from approximately 605 BC until 562 BC. And he was considered by his critics as the greatest biblical villain. So a lot of people don't like him. And he was credited with building or the construction of the very popular hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And history confirms that King Nebuchadnezzar built the gardens for his median wife, Queen Amethyst. If you Google it, of course, you won't see the actual photo anymore. You'll see artist renditions, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful structure. So his name was mentioned in the Bible more than 60 times. He was mentioned in Second Kings, Second Chronicles, books of Ezra, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, but he was spoken most in the book of Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar was famous for conquering Judah and destroying Jerusalem. And this is an important part of Jewish history. This was a prophecy. God had been faithful to fulfill his part of the covenant with his people, but the Israelites continued to disobey God with their idolatry and with their unfaithfulness. So he used the most ruthless king known to man at that time to punish his children. At that point, you, you, you think through it, right? Sometimes God uses even unbelievers, even you know, um, vicious people to execute judgment to his own people. And this is a good example. So God gave, um, or history records King Nebuchadnezzar as a brutal, powerful, and ambitious king. So like what I said, he used this ruthless king to bring judgment to his own people. So Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple of Jerusalem, and he took a lot of Israelites back to Babylon as exiles. And it included, of course, Daniel and his friends and many others. So God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream about what kingdoms would arise after his own. And the dream was interpreted by Daniel. That's the famous image made up of four different metals that represents Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and ultimately Rome. So Daniel interpreted the, the dream. And after his interpretation, um, King Nebuchadnezzar declared, Truly your God is God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries. So the personality of Nebuchadnezzar is a bit unusual. He's ruthless. Um, he's, he's bad. But from time to time in the story, you will see how he honored and how he proclaimed the true God of Israel. So this same king had Daniel's three friends thrown into the fiery furnace and God sent his angel and delivered them. Of course, you know the story of, uh, they say, the first law office in the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego. They, they, their names sound like a law office. So it was King Nebuchadnezzar who threw them into the fiery furnace. So God, once again, warned King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream to humble himself. He did not listen, so God drove him insane for seven years. So Daniel again um, interpreted the dream. It's about a huge and strong tree visible to the ends of the whole earth. So the tree, as revealed by God to Daniel, was King Nebuchadnezzar. So God humbled down this very powerful king and for seven years, he was like a crazy man. He was dwelling in the fields, eating grass with the beast. His hairs were long and his nails were like bird claws. So he lost everything. Nebuchadnezzar may be great and mighty king, but God showed him that he is almighty. Wonderful story, right? Based on the passage that we read from verse 34 to 37, it's possible that King Nebuchadnezzar became a believer towards the end of his life, as evidenced by his exclamations and praises to the one true God. You know, I love the story of King Nebuchadnezzar. After all his military conquests, you know, his achievements as a king, his majesty and his grandiose, for seven years he was like a crazy person. His friends deserted him, his families 
this on. He was living like a crazy man. But you know, if you ask me, those seven years were probably the most sane years of Nebuchadnezzar. I think when he was powerful and he was strong, that's when he was really crazy, right? But when he was rock, when he was down rock bottom, I think that's when he realized how powerful God is. The seven years in the wilderness made him realize that he was not that powerful after all. That God can easily take away everything from him. He was stripped off of everything and in the end, he acknowledged the one and true Almighty God. So the story of King Nebuchadnezzar is a great example of God's power and sovereignty over the most powerful man in this world. You know, Vladimir Putin is nothing compared to King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, his invasion of Ukraine is like child's play compared to what Nebuchadnezzar has achieved. You know, his military conquest. The Bible says his power extends towards the end of the earth. And yet God humbled him down. So history showed us time and again, someone very powerful can rise to power, but in the end, God can cause his downfall. Remember this passage, church. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. God has a purpose why he allows some evil man to flourish. We just don't know most of the time why. But at least in the Bible we can read some stories. We knew why God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to invade Jerusalem. It's a judgment to his people. So sometimes when bad things happen, you know, bad people come out. For believers, Romans 8.28, it's ultimately for our good. We just don't know what God is trying to accomplish. We just need to trust Him. So God is more powerful than all the kingdoms of this world combined. And remember when Jesus comes back in His second coming, He is no longer coming back as a suffering servant riding on a donkey, but He will come as a conquering king riding on a white horse with the vast army of the host of heaven behind Him. Remember that. Different scenario when Jesus comes back. So let's ponder upon this very important truth today. And maybe we can read it all together. Our God is omnipotent. He has power over all things at all times and in all ways. Praise the Lord. You know, the word omnipotent, I tried to take a look at it in the Bible a couple of times. I found it only once. I mean, the exact word omnipotent. Of course, the meaning of omnipotent, which is almighty, God almighty, is found uh, many times. But the word omnipotent, I only found it once in the King James Version. And that is Revelation 19, verse 6. It says here, And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. It's a song that we sing to, right? So in Hebrew, the title All or the title God Almighty is called El Shaddai. I'm sure you've heard the term El Shaddai. So it speaks of God's ultimate power over all things. And the word omni means all, and potent means power. So omnipotent means a God who is all powerful. So you know, in the Bible, God has many names. In the book of Genesis, He is the Almighty. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He spoke the universe into existence. He is the eternal God. In Ecclesiastes, He is the maker of all things. In Jeremiah, He is the eternal King, God of all mankind. In Isaiah, He is the everlasting kingdom, the King of heaven. In Job, He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed and miracles that cannot be counted. In Hebrews, He is the builder of everything. In Jude, He is the only God. In Ephesians, He is the God who is able to do more things than we can ever ask or imagine. You see, we have a God who is all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent. So let us learn how this once and how this once mighty, mighty and earthly King Nebuchadnezzar described God's power when he realized that His power is nothing compared to the Almighty. So he said, in the passage that we read, And I bless the Most High, and praise and honor Him, 
who lives forever for his dominion in an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Here is our first point. God's power is eternal and cannot be exhausted. God's power is eternal and cannot be exhausted. You know, last night we were, during the Bible study, we were talking about the price of gasoline, right? Here in Canada, reaching to almost $2 a liter. I don't know how much is it. $2. Wow. You know, experts say it will continue to go up if the war between Russia and Ukraine continues. Did you know that in 2021, Russia supplied almost 60% of Europe's oil requirement and around 8% of the world's supply? No wonder Russia is very confident that they will win the war. Maybe in their minds, the world needs them more than they need the world. You know, before we moved to Canada, I used to work in an oil company in the Philippines. In fact, at that time, it was the largest oil company, refinery and distribution company. And I saw how the price of oil can pretty much dictate how the economy is going. It's a very powerful factor uh, in, in dictating where the economy would go. So why is oil, or why is oil important? Well, oil is important because it's the source of power. It powers factories, it powers different kinds of transportation, it powers homes, offices, it powers equipment and many things. So where does oil come from? Well, crude oil is fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is formed underground for many, many years. And experts have predicted that the whole world will run out of fossil fuels in this century. They say that the oil reserves of the world can only last up to 50 years. So because of this grim reality, different countries are running a race towards what they call sustainable energy. Power coming from the wind, from water, from the sun. There's biothermal energy, there's geothermal energy, because they believe that sustainable energy is something that will never be depleted. You know, there was one silly question during an energy forum. A guy asked, he said, Oh, the sun cannot be considered as a source of sustainable energy because what happens when the sun stops generating heat? Well, I think mankind will have a bigger problem if the sun starts or stops generating heat, right? Don't you think? But here's the more important question. Who gives power to the sun? To the wind? To the water? Jeremiah 31, 35 answers the question. Says there, the Lord speaking, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who steers up the sea so that its waves roar? The Lord of hosts is his name. Amen. Something we should always acknowledge, Church. You know, God's power is eternal and it cannot be exhausted. In fact, the Bible says, In the new heaven and the new earth, there is no need for oil nor any kind of sustainable energy source. The Bible says the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its Lamb. It's a wonderful picture of what's going to happen, right? In heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth. We don't need oil. We don't need to depend on these superpowers, right? Because they, they think they can control the whole world. So let's go to our second one. So King Nebuchadnezzar experienced how it is to be at the top of his game. You know, he conquered so many kingdoms. He built some of the greatest structures known to man. We have an old saying in Filipino. I, I don't know if I remember it right. Kung gano kataas ang iyong paglipad sa simbahan ng tuloy. Sorry, that's not the right. That's not the right. <laughs> Kung gano'n kataas ang iyong paglipad, gano'n din kalakas ang iyong pagbansak. Brother Joey, can you translate it in English for the young man? The higher, the higher you fly. Okay. So of course we're talking here of you know, a person becoming too proud because of his accomplishments, someone who has achieved success in a short time, and he didn't care if he stepped on somebody's toes to be on top. So the higher you fly, the harder it is when you fall. I mean, this translation, literal. So that's common sense. If you don't fly too high, 
It won't be so hard when you fall. But the higher you fly, the harder you fall. But you know, Filipinos are philosophers. Philosophers. <laughs> Sabi nila, mataas na ang paglipad, the higher you fly, just breathe a parachute. Parachute, ha? Nang parachute. So King Nebuchadnezzar experienced falling into rock bottom. Remember, he ended up eating grass. He was wandering in the fields with a wild beast. His hairs were long. His fingernails were like bird claws. And he said in the passage, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Listen to these words. God's power is beyond measure. He creates, he preserves, and sustains his creation. So God did not only create the universe. He preserves it. He sustains it. Some people say, you know, we have a God who is a very passive God. He just created and then He left the creation all alone. That's not true. If God wakes for a bit, a, a half a second or something, you know, everyone will be chaos. Have you ever wondered what's going to happen if God allows the earth to move a bit closer to the sun or farther to the sun? It's going to be the end of the world. So every passing day, God preserves and sustains His creation. Although we know, and the Bible is very clear on that, that this world will come to an end. We know that. God will no longer sustain this world at one point. This world has gone so bad. The world will, uh, when Christians are raptured, when Jesus takes His followers, this world will spiral downward into apostasy and idolatry and all kinds of immorality. Just like any flesh, when the salt of the world is taken up, the world will decay. So God will not sustain this world anymore. But for those who believe in Jesus and the power of His salvation, we are bound to a much better place. You can always remember that. So in verse 37, King Nebuchadnezzar said, For His words are right, and His ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Remember when I preached the sermon, The Presence of God? I talked a little bit about the Hubble telescope. Remember that? So, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, they have been using the Edwin Hubble telescope since the 90s. And in a remarkable discovery, the Hubble provided proof that the universe is expanding uniformly in different directions. Prior to that discovery, church, scientists believe that the universe has always been there. It's eternal and it has no beginning. But because of Hubble's discovery, many scientists now agree that there must have been a time when the universe was there. If it's expanding, there must have been a time when the universe was very small or maybe not even there at all. Supporting what the Bible says about creation. That the universe was created by God out of nothing. It's called creatio ex nihilo. Created out of nothing. And Albert Einstein said the whole idea that this universe expands irritated him, but he considered later in his life and accepted the idea that the universe indeed had a beginning. So long before... The Hubble telescope discovered that the universe is expanding. The Bible said it many times already. Isaiah 45 says, God says, my own hands stretch out the heavens and marshal the heavenly host. Jeremiah 10 says, God stretch out the heavens by his understanding. And the word stretch in Hebrew is nata, which means to extend, to spread out. God didn't need Hubble Telescope to tell us that the universe is expanding. It's just that we need so much proof sometimes. Right? When it's the telescope telling us that the universe is expanding, that the universe is a beginning, then we try and start believing. But when the Word of God is saying that God is stretching out the heavens by His hand, we have a problem accepting it. Let's go to our third point. 
God's power creates something out of nothing. He can also turn something into nothing. That's an interesting point that I picked up from the passage. He can also turn something into nothing. So this is interesting. So God's power creates something out of nothing. Only God can do that. God can create something out of nothing. Show me somebody who can create something out of nothing. You know, there was a fictional story of a scientist who spent his whole life trying to create human beings out of dust in the ground. He was trying to be like God. And he said he can create man from the dust faster than God. So he challenged God and said, God, I'm going to ask you for a showdown. I'm going to show you that I can create man out of the dust of the ground faster than you can. So they met. So God created man out of the dust of the ground. And then when it's the scientist's turn, he cannot find any dust. And so when he asked God for the dust, God said, well, you have to create your own dust. <laughs> because God created man out of nothing. You can create a table out of the wood. But the wood has to come from the tree. And the tree has to come from the seed. It has to come from something. Only God has the power to create out of nothing. Amen? Amen. God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. As I've said, He is the only one who can do that. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing. Creatio ex nihilo. And interestingly, God can also turn something into nothing. What do I mean by that? It's, it's a metaphor. He can humble down the most prideful people on earth, like King Nebuchadnezzar. Jesus Christ said, whoever exalts himself will be humble. And the Bible tells us a lot of stories about proud kings who were brought down by the Lord. King Saul, even King David, King Nebuchadnezzar, of course, King Solomon. These are mighty men. These are great and powerful kings. King Solomon is so powerful, right? And yet at the end of his life, he was saying, life is meaningless. Everything is just meaningless. Because he had a lot of regrets in his life. He compromised his faith so much. Because he was marrying all these women, right? How many wives did Solomon have? 300? 700 wives and 300 porcupines and <laughs> concubines. <laughs> so Jesus um, tells us that those who exalt themselves will be humble. And Job spoke of God's power when he said, I know that you can do all things that no plan of yours can be thwarted. So Job acknowledged God's omnipotence when he carries out his plan. So in our time today, there may be kings or presidents who think they are invincible. They think they are superpowers. But when God says time is up, then there's nothing anyone can do. Amen? So now that we have a glimpse of the power of God, what's in it for us? I mean, how relevant is the power of God in our lives as believers? I mean, we can talk about God's omnipotence all day long, but how does it how does it affect me as a person? How does it affect me as a believer or follower of Christ? Listen to this. God's power can be shared by those united with God through Jesus Christ. Maybe a typical reaction to this. Really? The power of God that we just talked about, the power so great, is something that He shares to His children? It's a great mystery. Jesus Himself said this. Said this but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So God equips us with His power whenever we share the gospel to other people. And this is through the indwelling presence and fullness of the Holy Spirit. You see the Greek word used for power in this passage is dunamis. And Scholars say this is where we get the word dynamo or dynamite. So the Greek word for power means power of an army or the force of the heavenly host. So when we share the love of Jesus to other people, He equips us with that kind of power. The full force of God's power is with us. The heavenly host 
is backing us up whenever we try to share the love of Christ. Amen? But if you think this is too much, there's more. Listen to this. God's power is best seen in us when our weaknesses are greatest. Isn't that something? And again, this is Jesus Christ speaking. He said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power, my dunamis, is made perfect in your weakness. So therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. So God's power is exalted in us most when we are weak. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. When we are weak, the power of God is displayed in us. So we have this God the Father, the omnipotent God. We are struck by his power and by the fact that he is indeed a great and awesome God. But you know what? To me, the greatest demonstration of God's power is not in creation. It's not in sustaining or preser preserving the universe. To me, the power of God is best demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus conquered man's worst fear, which is death itself. Everyone is afraid of death. Especially if you don't know what's going to happen. People kill so that they won't die, which is ironic, right? So this almighty, omnipotent God, all-powerful, desires to have a personal relationship with man. And that desire culminated when he sent his only son to earth. God in the flesh. God incarnate. God and man, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that there is a way for forgiveness of our sins. The power of God raised Jesus from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus certainly demonstrates the power of God is so great because he conquered death. The Bible says death no longer has sting. And because he lives, we will live also. Amen? Amen. Before we close, I'm sure there's one question that lingers in your mind. What happens to King Nebuchadnezzar? We always want to know if he was saved or not, right? So was he saved? Well, the answer to that question is in Deuteronomy 29.29. <laughs> the secret things belong to the Lord our God, okay? Well, it's not a question that can be answered dogmatically, obviously. We, cannot, we won't know unless we go to heaven. But there are indications in the Bible, if you read the last words of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, that he submitted himself to the one true God. If you read the book of Jeremiah, three times the God or the Lord refers to King Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. So maybe he was a good saint. But whatever the case may be, the story of Nebuchadnezzar displays the power of God and a great example of God's omnipotence and sovereignty over all men. Amen? So before we pray, I'd like to call Ram to sing a song for us. You know, when Ram was in high school, he wrote some songs, seven worship songs, as part of his capstone project, and this is one of the songs that he wrote. And he'll, he will sing uh, the song today, it's about how that creation can praise an omnipotent and all-powerful and almighty God. So I'm going to turn over to Ram at this point, and then we're going to pray.
I'm sure about your relationship with the Lord. You have not truly surrendered your life to Christ. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Make this your own prayer. Um, say it from your heart. The prayer goes like this. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge today that you are omnipotent. You are all powerful. You are almighty. But then you sent your son, Jesus Christ, on this earth to die for me and redeem my condition and save me from the effects of sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But Lord, today I open my heart to your son, Jesus Christ, and I received him in my life as my Savior and as my Lord. And I know because of your power, you have resurrected him. And because he lives, I can also live. Father, thank you for this wonderful promise that I can look forward to a life eternal. May your Holy Spirit change me day by day and make me the kind of person that you want me to be. I give you the glory and praise, Almighty Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.